heard. So we're going to be reading um, a couple of different sections from John 6, verses 26 to 35, and then dropping down to verse 47, and reading through to verse 51. So this is the word of the Lord. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so we may see and believe you, they asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. And dropping down to verse 47. Truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Our gracious God, we do thank you for the privilege it is to come before you and come before your word. And we know your word is perfect. We know your word is inspired. It comes from you. And as we submit ourselves before it, uh, we ask that you would work in our hearts. May your spirit be at work this morning in our hearts, changing us. And transforming us and that's something that we expect we expect that because we're believers we're those who are called by you and your spirits living in us so we ask that you would change us and transform us more into the image of your son we thank you again for your grace and i pray that you'd be with me amen all right well, when i was young uh, there was three movies that played over and over on the vhs at our house Now, you may know some of these, you may not know some of them. But the first one was the cult classic, the 1985 movie, The Goonies. If any of you know The Goonies, there's probably not many, there's probably a couple of us weirdos out there. Look, it tells the story of a group of young misfits who ultimately stumble across a treasure map and go for a big treasure hunt. The second movie was the 1994 Disney favourite, The Lion King. It tells the story of the young lion cub Simba, who battles against all odds to reclaim his throne. But the movie that trumped all these movies, the movie that I think captured my thoughts more than any other movie possibly could, the movie that kept my eight-year-old little mind ticking over and over, was the movie Aladdin. It told the story of a poor street kid who meets the beautiful princess Jasmine. He falls madly in love with her and he must have her. In the background, the evil sorcerer Jafar, who has pledged to marry the princess, has devised a plan for Aladdin to sneak into the cave of treasures and take its one treasure above all, and that was the golden lamp. Now, as a child, I didn't care much for the story that was going on in the background. I didn't care for the love story. I didn't care for the, the long carpet rides at night, and I still, I still don't. But I did care. I did care about that golden lamp. Because in that golden lamp lived a magical genie who would grant three wishes to whomever would find it and summon him. See, my mind would run wild. It would run over and over. Well, I mean, as wild as an eight-year-old's mind could run anyway. See, it would go over and over, thinking of things that I could ask for. I wanted that sweet bike from Kmart, that 18-speed bike. I wanted that G.I. Joe that you could tip with a zip line from side to side of the room and shoot him across. And I wanted to go to Sizzler every night of the week. Yeah, preach it, preach it, they say. See, I thought the magical genie was pretty much the best thing a kid could could ask for. And as I grew up, I managed to put childish things away. I no longer wanted that sweet bike from Kmart or that G.I. Joe. The idea of eating at Sizzler, I still want, but I shouldn't have it. 
But see, as I grew up, I found it easy to put away the childish things. I found it easy to put away the toys, the games, the gadgets, and the gadgets. However, there still remains something in me, something in me that I can't do away with so easily. There remains in me a desire to have what I want, when I want it, and how I want it. There remains in me an appetite for the things of this world to be met whenever I want them met. But the truth is I'll never be satisfied. But there still remains a desire in me to rub a magical golden lamp and have all my wishes, my dreams and my expectations met. And unfortunately, this warps my view of who God is. See, I find there's a battle waging within me and it's maybe it's one battle that you have as well. I want to worship a God of my own liking. I want to worship a God who does what I want him to do, when I want him to do it and how I want him to do it. I want that magical genie God. And see, it's these false desires, it's these false expectations, ultimately false worship, that our passage confronts today. But like my eight-year-old appetite for the goodies of this world, the appetites of those who were following Jesus that day were too short-sighted. See, as we come to our passage this morning, we see those same misguided sinful desires that I had, and that I still have, in a people who are expecting Jesus to perform their next miracle for him. They wished for a king who would satisfy their earthly appetites. But Jesus was a king who satisfies their eternal appetites. He's the king who offers eternal life. And that brings us to the main point of our passage this morning, or our big idea. It's this, that Jesus is a better king than we could ever wish for. Now we're going to be working our way through John chapter 6 this morning under these two simple headings. An earthly appetite never finds satisfaction and eternal appetites find satisfaction in Jesus. Now I encourage you, there on the back of your bulletin, take some notes. Uh, it would be really helpful to think through these things throughout the week. I know at Grace Group, uh, this, is a, this is a bigger side, but I know at Grace Group when we meet on Wednesday and we actually go over the notes and we actually go over the sermon, it's a real good thing to plug back into what was said on Sunday because believe it or not, by Wednesday it's very easy to forget. Um, so taking notes will help. But before we do that, before we get into John chapter 6, uh, I thought maybe we'll just do a bit of an introduction to John. See, we're taking our normal trip out of the book of Acts and we're going to John for two weeks, this week and next week. We're going to be in John 6 this week and John 9 next week. I know there's some ladies who are working their way through the book of John uh, together, so I thought mapping out John very quickly will help give us some structure this morning. See, the Apostle John tells us in John chapter 20, 30 to 31, that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that were not written in this book. But these signs were written so we could read of them And we can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in his name, we may have life in his name. And John uses these miracles as signs to point to who Jesus is, what Jesus has come to do, and what type of kingdom he's come to bring. So over the last year, I don't know if you've noticed, we've slowly been working our way through some of these signs in the book of John to get a clearer picture of who our Lord is. The second thing that is worth noting in the book of John is this, that he tends to use a lot of symbolism. He uses a lot of allusions to the Old Testament to get his point across. We saw this in the first sign, when Jesus turned the water into wine. He used the water as a symbol of the Old Testament washings for purification. And he used the wine as the symbol of the new kingdom that he was going to bring. A symbol of joy, of celebration, with Christ at the centre. And if you know the book of John, you see this again in chapter 3. He talks to Nicodemus about Jesus having to be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake the bronze snake in the book of Numbers. We see it again in chapter 4, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. He talks about the water of this well. Well, you'll drink it and you'll get thirsty again. But if you drink of the water that I give, you will never thirst again. So John uses these signs to point who who Jesus is, what Jesus came to do and what type of kingdom he was going to bring. And he tends to use highly symbolic language to do it. And so in our story this morning, we shouldn't be surprised when he uses these symbols. We shouldn't be surprised when he actually refers back to the Old Testament and he alludes to it. They convey the meaning of our passage. And both Jesus and John, as the author, use these things to point to a greater reality of what was going on. So with that as a little introduction to the book of John, let's turn to our first point. Earthly appetites never find satisfaction. Now you would have noticed this morning that we picked up halfway through or verse 24 uh, through John chapter 6. So it's going to be helpful that we travel back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and look at the actual feeding of the 5,000, which this story continues on from. 
So we're going to do some broad brushstrokes over chapters one or verses 1 to 15 to understand why a group of hungry Jewish people uh, followed Jesus across to the other side and tried to make him king. This is going to help set the context of the story. So keep your Bibles open at chapter 6. But as a heads up, especially in this first section, we're going to be referring to a lot of Old Testament passages. I encourage you not to flick here and flick there. Just write them down. Write them down. They'll be up on the screen. Uh, Come back and look at them later. Test if if what I'm saying is actually true. Um, But I don't want you to get distracted by back and and forward. So keep it open and chop in chapter 6 and um, take the notes down for the rest of them. Now it may be surprising to some of you, but believe it or not, that the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the only miracles other than the resurrection of Jesus himself that is recorded in all four Gospels. And this should tell us something about how important this actual miracle was. It should tell us there's something crucial about understanding what's going on in this miracle and the life of Jesus. So our story starts on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We don't know exactly where. It's about one night's trip from the city of Capernaum, and it's in the region of Bethsaida. We learn that from Luke. And it's uh, the place where Philip was from. And Jesus is there with his disciple, and he notices a crowd. And the crowd numbers over 5,000. We don't know the exact number. We know from the other Gospel accounts that there's at least 5,000 men. So there could be anywhere between 5, 7, 10, possibly even 15,000 people. And in verse 2, we find out what compelled them to make the journey. It says that they saw the signs. They saw the signs that Jesus had already performed, and they wanted in on the action. So when we arrive in verse 4, we now get an important reminder of why this is crucial in the life of Jesus. We find out from verse 4 that it's Passover season, and this is crucial to our understanding of the passage. If we remember, John uses these symbolisms, these allusions in the Old Testament, to make his point clear. So the mention of Passover should make our eyebrows rise. It should make our ears stick up and go, oh, it's Passover. That's very, very crucial to our story. This is Exodus language. This is the language of the Israelites leaving Egypt, the institution of the Passover feast, the wilderness wanderings. It's not the only language that we see here. See, if we see this passage in comparison with the book of Numbers, we start to notice, wool. There's a lot of little comparisons that we see between John 6 and Numbers, and in particular, Numbers chapter 11. See, what we see is, both in Numbers 11 and in John chapter 6, there's a need for food. In John 6 verse 5, Jesus says to Philip, how are we going to feed these people? In Numbers 11 13, Moses asked the Lord, where am I going to get meat for all these people? Again, both in Numbers and John, we see the provision of manna. In John 6.31, they refer to the manna that God provided through the hands of Moses. In Numbers 11, we actually see that manna. It was a seed-like substance that would come at night. It would be formed from the dew, and they would get it, and they would get it, they would grind it, they'd mix it with water, they'd turn it into flour, they'd bake their cakes and eat them. In Numbers 11 and 6, we see the theme of complaining. In both John 6.41 and 43, the people start complaining and grumbling about this idea of true manna which has come from heaven. In Numbers 11, we see the complaining again. They no longer had the melons and the cucumbers and the garlics and the leeks that they had in Egypt. And there's even a disproportionate amount of food to people. In John 6, we see five barley loaves and two small fish for 5,000 people. And in Numbers 11, 21, Moses estimates close on 600,000 soldiers to feed with a month's worth of cattle. And so when we read about this miracle, all these illusions set the backdrop for how we should interpret it. And so in verse 10 and 11, Jesus directs the crowd to sit down. He takes some food from a little boy, he gives thanks, and the great feeding happens. The food just keeps coming. Through a miraculous act of God's provision, the people are fed full, and there's 12 baskets left over. Again, it's another illusion, just like we see in chapter 2 with the wine. It was the best wine that anyone could ever drink. And so now it's the most abundant food anyone could possibly ever think for. It points again of what God's new kingdom with God's new king is like. Now it's commonly accepted that the Jews of the day were eagerly waiting the day of their Messiah, the return of their saviour king. And it's this great hope that's explained in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. There was an expectation that one day, and it would be soon, God would send his champion and he would free us. He would restore the nation, he would kick out the bad guys, and along with these expectations, there was also a list of scriptural criteria. 
There's things that this Messiah must do. For example, we see in Deuteronomy 18, 18, that this new leader would be someone like Moses. He would be a leader and a prophet like Moses. So Deuteronomy 18, 18 says, It says, I'll raise up a prophet like Moses. I'll put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command. We see this most clearly in the Sermon of the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7. Israel's new leader standing on a mountain. Wow, coincidence. Moses did that. Israel's new leader standing on a mountain giving the commandment. Oh, wow, coincidence. God did that. So this is the new leader that has now come. This is the new prophet. So he'd be a prophet like Moses. That's a big tick. Jesus gets that one. But he'd also be from the Davidic line. 2 Samuel 7 tells us that the king who would rule on God's throne would be an eternal king and he would be from the family of David. Well, John 1 tells us that Jesus was there in the beginning. He is eternal. He was always there. We also find throughout the Gospels numerous times that Jesus is from the family line of David. So it would need to be an eternal king from the family of David. Tick. Jesus gets that one. He would also need to be someone who performed miraculous deeds or did miracles. Isaiah 35 and 61 speak of the messianic age or the person, the Messiah himself. During these times, blind eyes would be opened. Lame would leap for joy. The mute would have their mouths open. They would speak again. Coincidentally, this is just the passage in Isaiah 61 that Jesus refers to in Luke chapter 4. He stands up, opens the scroll and says, I'm that guy. I'm the guy who is going to do all those things. And in John 9, we see the man born blind. He gets healed. John 5, we see the lame man by the bull of Bethesda. He gets healed. And in Mark 3, we see the man who is a mute. And Jesus heals him as well. So the Messiah would need to be a miracle worker. Tick. Gets that one as well. So when you line up all these illusions and the expectations of a prophet like Moses, it's no wonder they responded like they did in verse 14. In verse 14 that says this, Surely this is the prophet. That is the prophet that we have been waiting for. He's now come into the world. But then something strange happens in verse 15. Read along with me in verse 15, John chapter 6. It says, When Jesus realized they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew to the mountain by himself. Now, if you're reading this for the first time or you've got no prior knowledge of God's story or God's people, you must be you're sitting there scratching your head wondering, I, I don't get it. I mean, he is their king. He fulfills all these little markers. He got all those ticks. Why doesn't he just take his role as king? It's a good question. It's a really good question. But see, it's only when Jesus goes back to Capernaum in our passage this morning that we read that we find out why Jesus won't entrust himself as their king. And so we read in verse 26, as we read this morning, Truly I tell you, you are not looking for me. In other words, you're not trying to make me king because you saw the signs. But it's because you ate your loaves and you were filled. See, the truth is they didn't want Jesus as their king because they thought he was their Messiah. They wanted Jesus as their king because, hey, here's a free feed. He can look after all of our needs. They wanted their bellies full. And it's here in our text that we must stop and get a little bit personal. See, it's easy to sit from afar and look at these people with a big question mark and a bit of disgust, thinking, don't you guys get it? Don't you know who Jesus is? He's not your magical genie who can perform your tricks. He isn't your traveling all-you-can-eat buffet bar. But then we have to stop and look at our own lives and take a long, hard look at ourselves and ask ourselves those same questions, which is not easy. Is, am I like that? Am I like the crowd that day? Do I have the same attitude towards Jesus as they did without even realizing it? Am I controlled by my appetite for the things of this world instead of the things that Jesus truly came to give? You know, to assess our hearts, we have to ask some simple but yet probing questions. It could be as simple as the question that Jesus asked. Am I more concerned about my belly than I am about the Lord? Do my food choices consume my thoughts, whether they be healthy or unhealthy? Do I think more about the fad diet than the Lord Jesus? Do I think more about the pleasures that food can give me than the peace that Christ offers me? Other questions like this. Am I more concerned about the decor of my house than the doctrine of my life? 
Do I rejoice more in my favourite football team or the forgiveness that I have in the Lord? Do I set aside time in my week to watch that favourite sitcom? But I can't seem to set aside time to read the scriptures. And those are hard questions to ask. Hard questions to ask myself. It has been hard this week to ask myself those questions. See, let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, that when we want comfort and sorrow, Jesus is there. When we want strength and difficulty, Jesus is there. When we want peace and turmoil, when life has got us down, there's no one as wonderful as our Lord. He invites us to walk with him. He invites us to talk with him, to lay our hearts bare before him. But See, when he comes to our life with these ideas of sacrifice, these ideas of challenge, When he comes to us with the idea of suffering for his name's sake, when he commands us to forsake our sin, take up our cross, love the unlovable, when he commands us to forsake the old way of life, sadly I say in my own life, there's times where I don't even want to know him. That's a problem. And it's a problem because my sight and my vision of Jesus is far too small. See, they'd followed Jesus to get their bellies filled. They'd only had an appetite for the things of the earthly. So they'd wished for a king who would provide for their physical needs. Take away their oppressors. Make them a strong nation again. But their wishes, just like mine, were far too short-sighted. Jesus had come to be a better king than that. In verse 27, we take a turn in our passage. Jesus takes their focus from the earthly food to the eternal. From the food that he gave them to the heavenly food that he was, that they needed. And so in verse 27, if you read with me, he says, Don't work for food that perishes, but for food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his approval, or his seal of approval, upon him. And this brings us to our second point. Earthly or eternal appetites find their satisfaction in Jesus. Now, on a typical date night with my wife, my mum will generally pop around about 5.30 in the afternoon and me and my wife will jump in the car and we'll head out. Typically what happens is we take the quick 10-minute trip down to the Hyperdome. We'll grab something to eat and sometimes we'll catch a movie. Now, if you're familiar at all with the Hyperdome, which probably some of you are, or most of you are, in the Piazza area, that's the outdoor eating area, there's a number of places where you can go and sit and you can go and eat. You have your childhood favourite, or at least my childhood favourite, um, Sizzler. You have a few sushi places. You have an Italian place, a cafe, a steakhouse. You can get fish and chips from the beach house. Uh, You can get some spicy chicken from Nando's. Now, on the rare occasion, we rocked up to the Piazza, and I looked to my wife, and I suggest that we should try somewhere different tonight. And so, like the wonderful wife she is, she joins me in circling around the piazza, entertaining my fantasies, while we look at all the different menu options. Now, that may sound pretty standard to some people, but it's funny when it happens to us. Because every time we do that, we still end up at the same place. (laughs) Every time we do it, we look around to see what we feel like that night, and we end up at the same shop. We end up at the Mullineux and the Booker's favourite burger shop, Burger Urge. Now, it's not because we don't like other cuisines. No, it's not. It's not that other shops are out of our budget. It's simply because we know when we go to our favourite burger shop and we order our favourite burger, we always walk away going, that's a good burger. (laughs) Always. But see, it's just as Peter and I find satisfaction in the perfect burger on date night, we too are to find our satisfaction in Jesus alone. Now, the risk of sounding too cliche and a little bit dorky, the truth is the same. Jesus doesn't want us walking around the piazza of life to find our satisfaction. He wants us to go straight to him to have our satisfaction met. So he tells his followers, don't work for food that perishes. Work for food that will satisfy your eternal appetite. Work for eternal things. And in verse 28, his responders or his followers respond with probably one of the most helpful questions in the whole Bible. In verse 28, he says this, What can we do to perform the works of God? What can we do to perform the works of God? Now, essentially, they're asking the question that's been asked 
asked a number of times throughout the scriptures. We see it on the day of Pentecost. What should we do to be saved? We see it with the Philippian jailer. What should we do to be saved? How can I inherit eternal life? It's the very question that the rich young ruler asked Jesus one day, wasn't it? In Mark 10, we come across an interesting dialogue between Jesus and this rich young ruler. And if you're taking notes, the, the story is actually in Mark 10, 17 through 27. So someone comes to Jesus and says, Master, well, well good man, what, what must I do to have eternal life? What work must I perform? What is it? You tell me and I'll go ahead and I'll do it. Jesus responds to him, you know the commandments. You know what the law of God requires. Go and do them. If you want eternal life, you must be righteous. He responds, well, I've done all those things, teacher. I haven't murdered, I haven't committed adultery, I haven't stolen, etc., etc., etc. And then Jesus digs a little bit deeper into the man's life. He says, well, if you've done all those, sell everything. Sell everything and come and follow me. And now if you're familiar with the story, you know that the man doesn't. He loves his stuff. He wanted his things over wanting God. But what's the principle being taught? It's not that we should sell all our belongings and follow Jesus. Now, the principle being taught is this, that to stand before a holy God, one must be completely righteous. God's standard of righteousness is perfection. If you have perfection, you can get into his heaven. And Jesus says this in the most clearest terms on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, verse 20, he says, I tell you the truth, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never You will never enter the kingdom of God. God's standard is perfection. And perfection, without perfection, we will not have eternal life. And for us in this room, myself included, that's a big issue. Because when we measure ourselves against God's standard, we fall short. As a matter of fact, when we measure ourselves against our own standards, we fall short. So they ask in verse 28, what can we do to perform the works of God. What can we do to have eternal life? What can we do to meet the standard to get into God's heaven? And in verse 29, Jesus gives the most glorious answer that I and you and anyone else could ever have. He says, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. You believe in the one he has sent. If you want this eternal life I speak of, if you want the eternal food that satisfies the souls, if you want to enter into my Father's heaven for all eternity, if you want a righteousness that is needed to stand before God, you simply believe in me. This is my gift to you. Brothers and sisters, this is the greatest news (laughs) that our gospel is. It's... How can a sinful person be justified and deemed righteous before a holy God? Faith alone. By God's grace alone. Because of what Christ has done alone. That's it. You know, during grace groups this week, someone asked the question, is belief a work? And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in the Son. Is belief a work? And that's a great question. It's so great a question that, believe it or not, nearly every generation of the church since Christ's ascension has asked that very question. Now, there are those on one side of the camp who would argue that God meets us halfway in our salvation. He's done everything needed for people to be saved. He sent his son. He died upon the cross. He took the penalty for our sins. Man simply needs to reach out and grab hold of the salvation that God has offered. Now, in our lives, if we're honest, it often looks like that. People come to Christ and they say, yeah, I want this Jesus. And they become a Christian and they, God continues to grow them. But behind the scenes, there's far more going on. So the issue with thinking this way is that man still remains the catalyst in his own salvation. He remains the one who makes the decision whether or not someone is saved or not. And if this is the case, man is able to boast. He's able to boast in his wise decision making. Look how smart I am. I chose Jesus and you didn't. Nah, 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 nah. But this isn't what the scriptures teach. The scriptures tell us plainly that man remains dead. He is unable to make a decision for Christ until God enables him to come to Christ. 
We see this clearly in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. It tells us that before our salvation, we were dead in sin. That is, we were completely unable to reach out for Christ. We were by nature under wrath of God's wrath, children of God's wrath. But yet God in his loving kindness made us alive in Christ. We were dead, but God saved us by his grace. And it's by this grace we were saved through faith, through belief. And these things are apart from ourselves, for they are God's gift, so that no one may boast. Salvation is God's gift to people, not a result of our own works. So when we ask the question, is believing a work? Well, no, it's not. It's a gift that God graciously gives people to believe to come to Christ. And so if you're here this morning and you've never heard the gospel, or if you've never understood the gospel, in as short as I possibly can, this is it. That Christ came to die for your sins, to take your penalty upon himself. And that if we believe and if we trust in him, he not only takes the punishment for our sin, but he gives us his perfect righteousness. The very righteousness that you and I need to stand before a holy God. And to all those who come to him, he will not cast out. To all those who place their trust in him, Jesus will keep forever. To those who come to God, to come to Christ, God will continue working in. You know, as a side note, it, it, it's very easy in a church to decide that there's people here who don't know the gospel and haven't become Christians. If that's something that you'd like to chat about after, if you're wanting to make a decision for Christ, or if you are a Christian, you don't quite understand exactly how it is you got here, I'll be down here after the service. I'd love to chat with you. Uh, I'm sure there'll be one of the other elders down here as well. So. But we turn back to John chapter 6. See, after the question is their response in verse 30, and it's quite puzzling. See, instead of seeing in the bread the sign, they seen in the sign merely the bread. Let me say that again. Instead of seeing in the bread the sign, they seen in the sign merely the bread. They had completely missed what happened. And like missing the bow or missing the punchline to a joke, they stand there with an awkward look on their face, coming to Jesus, wanting him to prove himself. And they immediately ask him, um, they immediately ask him, if you want us to believe in you, you're going to have to give us a sign. So we read in verse 30 and 31. You know, what sign is it that you're going to do that we may believe in you? What sign are you going to perform? Our ancestors, well, they ate manna in the wilderness. Just as it is written, he gave them bread to, from heaven to eat. And like someone has just flicked a switch, the crowd has gone from asking one of the best questions in the Bible to one of the most puzzling questions you could think of. So they just had a first-hand experience on the other side of the sea, in which God miraculously fed over 5,000 people with five loaves and two small fish. And now they ask for a sign. But what's going on here? I believe there's two things happening. First, they simply just wanted more food. Look, they were hungry again. It was a long walk from there to here, and you know Jesus was their meal ticket. Say, hey, Master, we're hungry again. But I think there's more behind the passage, and it's more that probably drives into our own heart. So what they're really saying is this, we'll believe in you if you give us another one of those signs. What type of sign do you want us to perform? Or what, time do, what type of sign do we want you to perform? Well, that's simple. We'll give you a hint. Our ancestors, they ate manna in the wilderness. Have you got any more? Got any more of that bread, Jesus? It's as if they're saying, if you want to be validated in our eyes, you need to show us the bread. And this attitude is something we see in the scripture Time and time again, and it's something we see in our own lives and the lives around us time and time again. People say things like this. If Jesus wants me to be part of his kingdom, he's going to have to come up with some pretty spectacular evidence. If he thinks I'm going to worship him, he's going to need to perform some pretty amazing signs. But you see, it's not lack of evidence that people don't follow Christ. And this is clear from our passage the evidence was clear. Jesus fed thousands of them. They ate the evidence. <laughs> they literally consumed it. It was in their belly. And so people demanded that the requirement be met by Jesus before they would follow him. They put Jesus on trial and they demanded their needs to be met. 
See, the truth is, it's not for lack of evidence that people don't follow Christ. It's for the lack of a right heart. Salvation comes when people hear the good news and God changes their hearts. And this is something that we all must remember. Not only in our own lives, but in the lives of those who we're seeking to share Christ with. We may not have all the answers, but we do have the message of forgiveness in Christ. See, we may not have all the answers, but we do have the message that you were far off from Christ, but God has brought you near through him. You were once a child of God's wrath, but now you can be a child of God's love. You can be brought near to God because of what Jesus has done. This is why Paul meant when he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1. In verse 20, he says this, Jews ask for a sign, Greeks seek wisdom, but we, we preach Christ crucified, for Christ is the power of wisdom of God. Again, he continues in the next chapter. He says, when we came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God, that is how we can be reconciled, we didn't come to you with brilliance of speech. We just decided to know nothing among you other than Christ and him crucified. So brothers and sisters, can I encourage you, if you're seeking to share the gospel with others, make sure you do that very thing. You must preach Christ. You must preach his death for sins. You must preach his burial, his resurrection to life, and his ascension as the eternal judge over all. Now in saying that, I'm not suggesting that we switch off our minds. We don't ignore the debates. I'm not suggesting that, no, I'm not going to answer your questions because you are blind. No, we do answer questions. We give a reason for the faith that we have. When sincere skeptics ask, we should have an answer. But above all, we must preach the gospel because it's in this message that people come to salvation. And this is exactly what we see Jesus doing in the next few verses. In verse 32 and 33, Jesus reminds them that God has provided for their needs in the wilderness. And it was God who was providing for their needs now. See, in the wilderness, God gave you earthly food. He sustained your earthly needs because he's a good, loving and caring God. But now God has provided your eternal food that will sustain your real and eternal needs. Read with me again in verse 32 and 33. It says, Truly I tell you, says Jesus, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread from heaven is the one who came down from heaven and gives the life word, gives life to the world. And they responded, Sir, give us this bread always. And in verse 35, Jesus again makes it as clear as he possibly can. In verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the one that the Father has given. I am the one who has come to give eternal life. No one who ever comes to me will be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever thirst again. Brothers and sisters, this is why Jesus is our better king. This is why Jesus is the best king we could ever wish for. He's the king who brings eternal life, not just earthly provisions. In the first section of our sermon, we saw a people who were quite happy to accept Jesus as their prophet and their king. The problem is that was only half the story. They'd sold themselves short and they'd sold Jesus short of the type of king he was. They had forgotten what their greatest need was. They had forgotten that their biggest problem was an eternal one. And it's not one that can be fixed by loaves and fishes. Verse 47 through 51, Jesus says this. Jesus says, I tell you, anyone who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, well, they ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and may not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I give to the life uh, the bread that I give for life to this world is my flesh. See, they had thought that their greatest need was an earth, earthly food. But everyone who eats of that food will die. And this is exactly what Jesus says. He says, look at your ancestors. God provided for them. Where are they now? Dead. 
I've got something far more important that you need, and that is my flesh. And I'm going to give my flesh so you can have eternal life. Jesus' mission on earth was clear. He came to die. He came that he may give his life as a ransom for those who would come to him. This would happen soon after Jesus spoke these very words. Soon his flesh would be offered up. He was their great prophet. He was their great king. But he was also their great high priest. He was the one who came to offer himself on their behalf. Offer himself on my behalf. Offer himself on your behalf. So that we may have eternal life. And so brothers and sisters, before we close up and before we leave this room, before we go off and have lunch with our friends, before we visit our family or whatever it is we're going to do today, it's my job to ask you this. Have you sold Jesus short? Have you, in your ignorance of your own failings before God, sold Jesus short? Have you forgotten that your greatest need in this life is not your comfort? It's not the riches that the world offers. It's not the new home, the new car, the new shoes. It's not the correct balance of work and play. It's not having our desires met. It's not acceptance among our peers. It's not good grades at school. All these things are important. But your greatest need is the forgiveness that's offered through Christ. It's the gift of His righteousness before God that you need. As we close, I read this week a a story about a Scottish man who's making his way from Scotland to the America in the 18th century. He'd purchased a one-way ticket on one of those large ocean liners and he didn't have a great deal of money for the trip, so beforehand he just decided to save on the cost of food by stacking up on crackers and cheese and fruit before his departure to America. You know, when the ship set sail, he sat down below deck in his quarters and nibbled away on his rations of his crackers and his cheese and his fruit. And this went on fairly well for the first four or five days. But see, as the ship grew closer to the New York line, the crackers became increasingly stale. The cheese, as you would expect, became mouldy, and the fruit had become rotten. The Scotsman thought to himself, well, I've saved all this money by packing all this food beforehand. Surely, if I go up the stairs for one meal, it won't be too expensive. So he travelled up to the dining room for one last meal. And he was greeted with the shock of his life. See, he hadn't realised that when he bought the ticket, it included full dining privileges. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. So the unfortunate thing about this story is it often tells a tale of our own Christian lives, of my life, sitting below deck, eating our stale crackers, our mouldy cheese and our rotten fruit. When Christ and all his riches are up board, let us not forget the grace that he offers is an abundant grace. Jesus is a better king than we could ever wish for because he alone can satisfy our eternal appetites. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we are humbled before you. When we look at our own lives and we look at what Christ has done and yet we still see in ourselves this pack of hungry Jewish people. Help us to remember that our greatest need has been provided for in Christ. Help us to remember that our greatest need is a righteousness which is not our own. It's a righteousness that you give because of what Christ has done. Father, help us not to leave from here the same. We pray that your spirit would change our hearts. You would work in our hearts.